Hello and welcome. Um, this is the second in a four part webinar series celebrating spring migration at Whitefish Point. Um, we're really happy to have you joining us tonight. Um, we're going to be talking about raptor IDs and um, that'll be really exciting for everyone. But before we get to that, I want to cover a few logistics so that we can have a successful webinar together. Um, there's two ways you could be joining us this evening, either through Zoom or through Facebook. Um, if you're joining us through Zoom, you can submit questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you're joining via Facebook, you can add your comments or add your questions directly to the comments section. Um, I'll monitor those throughout the chat um, or throughout the presentation, but we'll answer those at the end. So we'll take them anytime, but answer them when we, when we finish and we'll get to those as many of those as possible. This presentation is being recorded and it will be available for future viewing. Um, It'll be available immediately after ending on our Facebook page, and we'll get the video uploaded to the Michigan Audubon YouTube channel probably sometime next week. So if you're watching a recording of this, or if you have questions at a later time, you can send those to us at the Michigan Audubon general email address at birds at michiganaudubon.org. So as I mentioned before, this webinar is part of a series of webinars that highlight the different ongoing research and monitoring efforts at Whitefish Point Bird Observatory and it celebrates the magic of spring migration. So even if you can't be there to witness it, you can feel like you're part of it. Um, so if you missed last week's webinar on the Owls of Whitefish Point, you can watch that recording through our Facebook page or through the Michigan Audubon YouTube channel. Whitefish Point Bird Observatory is a program of Michigan Audubon and WPBO, as it's often called, has been monitoring and documenting the migration of tens of thousands of birds that funnel through the point each spring and fall for over 40 years. So if you'd like to learn more about the history of WPBO, um, read current field staff blogs, and watch live count data via Dunkadoo, you can do that on our website at wpbo.org. So today we're lucky to be joined by our current WPBO hawk counter, Rich Kaus. And um, Rich is excited to share his tips and tricks, um, the ones he utilizes as the hawk counter at WPBO and other hawk watching sites across the country. So with that, I'll hand things over to you, Rich. Hi. Uh, th thank you, Lindsay. Um, so, like I said, I'm the hawk counter at uh, WPBO, and I'll be talking to you uh, tonight about raptor ID. Um, so, strap yourself in. Um, there's over 500 raptors in the world. This is going to take about six hours. Um, uh, hold on. Uh, I spent two months preparing this. All right, I'm being told that it's only Eastern hawks of the United States that I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, so I guess it'll be about a half hour or so, um, give or take a few uh, minutes. So Eastern raptors, um, there's a select group that we'll go through of what you're most likely to see um, here at Whitefish Point. Um, my season starts, um, on March 15th, and this is the scene uh, I arrived at, there's still snow on the ground. Usually a lot more snow than there was this year, um, but still still enough to, to cover the ground. Um, it dissipated pretty fast because we had a, a real warm week uh, the last week of March, uh, which brought actually a lot of birds and melted all the snow that was on the ground. Um, so this is the stairway up to the hawk deck. Uh, the hawk deck is is located on the high point uh, at Whitefish Point. Um, it's on the top of a dune. Um, and what you see here is the raised platform in the shack that um, shields me from the wind that blows right off the Lake, Lake Superior, which is right to the north of, of this deck. Um, it can get quite, quite chilly, like throughout the day. And that shack is my refuge and which keeps me uh, in one piece on uh, many, many a day in March and, and April. Um, in fact, today was the first day of the whole season that I could actually be out on the deck without a coat on. Um, and when I say coat, like I, I've been wearing my heavy winter coat all season long. Um, so if you plan on coming to Whitefish Point to watch hawks, um, make sure you dress 
for the occasion because it's, it's, it's unprotected. The wind comes right off the lake a lot um, and it can be quite cold. Uh, unless you come in May and days like today, it starts to get warm and then, then you don't have to worry about it so much. Um, but just keep your eye on the weather and wait for the great day. Um, what you see here on the deck is my spotting scope, which will, um, it's right here. And for those of you who don't get out watching hawks a lot, um, one of the first things you'll, you'll need is good optics. Um, now, so that's a, a pair of binoculars or a spotting scope, even better, because most of the time um, you're watching them at quite a distance. Uh, they don't come in close all the time unless the winds are in the right direction, which they'll fly right over the deck. But most of the time, you look in three binoculars, and if you have a spotting scope, we can really bring them in a lot closer so you can get a good look at them. If you're shopping for binoculars, I, I would look for the highest. For hawk walking, watching specifically, I would recommend a 10 power binocular just because the higher the power, the greater the magnification. Um, 10 power is basically 10 times what the human eye sees. Um, and the thing sacrifice with that, if you're getting general birding, um, sometimes 10 power is a little too strong to see birds up close if they're perching, like you see this little tree behind me, it's really tough to focus on a bird that's perched right on that if it's really close. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, if, if you're out looking for hawks, your optics are what will get you there. Um, so, a little bit about hawks and their behavior. Um, is hawks travel in kettles? Yeah, you know, we don't refer to them as flocks or, don't, or groups. Um, it's called kettles uh, because what they do is they is if you heat a kettle, you have hot air that rises from it, and and they use those what we call thermals to rise. And so this is what they tend to look like. Um, this is a cattle hawks, which are riding a thermal airstream. Um, so when you're looking for them, you're looking for these groups that are in the air. And a little bit like how therm thermal, how they use the, the thermals. The sun heats the ground, the air rises, and the birds rise with it, which gives them enough lift so they can soar until they reach the next thermal and rise again. And that's kind of how they move. If you, if you watch a group of hawks kettling in the air, you'll see individuals kind of swing out and search for that next thermal. And you'll see them slowly move over to where the next thermal is and they begin kettling over there. Um, and that's how um, the, the bulk of hawks migrate. Um, your eagles and your budios um, take little advantage of it because they're really soaring birds, and we'll get a little more into that as we as we talk about each species. Um, just another slide um, explaining where you might find these hawks. If you notice the picture I showed you before, there was a big cum cumulus cloud there, and where the clouds are. It, You'll see the groups of hawks because it just kind of shows you the clouds, I guess, ride thermals also. Um, so you see even this glider is the same principle as, as it goes from one lift to the next lift. And so as the, the birds move up the point, here is a kind of reference to um, the whole Great Lakes area. I'm not sure how many of you are watching from far away. Um, but Michigan is in the United States. If there's any people from uh, outside of the US, um, it's in the Midwest, the north, the north of the Midwest where the Great Lakes are. Um, this is the, the lower peninsula and this is the upper peninsula up here. I'm, I'm hoping you can see my little mouse thing that around. Normally when I'm in person, I get a little pointer. Um, Whitefish Point is this point right here 
at the tip. Um, so what the birds do is they, they, they'll follow the, these warm air currents and it'll get them to the point. And if the winds are favorable, a lot of them will make this flight straight across, um, which I believe is about 23 miles um, from one side to the next. And a, and a lot of birds rely on getting enough altitude from the thermals to move them over. If it's not working for them those days, if, if the wind's strong from the north, they'll come up to a point, but they'll end up moving back, back down and they'll probably end up traveling along Whitefish Bay and moving north through the Sioux St. Marie and into Canada that way, because all these birds are going into Canada. Um, Yeah, and there's the wonderful Great Lakes. It's a wonderful area. So just to show you um, a little bit of how the birds travel, this is some telemetry data collected by the Eastern Golden Eagle Working Group. Um, what this group did is, is they is they capture golden eagles, they place transmitters on them and they track their movements. Um, what they've discovered is that golden eagles are birds that are largely associated with the American West. Um, what they found there is an Eastern population um, where a lot of them, you'll see, they do a lot of work in the Appalachians. And that's where most of them will stay in the winter as far south as Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia. Um, and they'll spend their winter there. Um, select birds will either come up through the lower peninsula and cross at the Straits. And from the Straits, they'll move and in, go into uh, Ontario. The golden eagles that they've tracked that move to Wisconsin will either keep a westerly track um, through Hawk Ridge and up in to Ontario that way, or They'll travel east through, through the Upper Peninsula. When they get to the Upper Peninsula, this is a, a few golden eagles that they zoomed in on here. They all travel east. And the blue paths are the spring migration of these eagles. Um, so you see them all moving east. They'll come up to the peninsula. You'll notice that this bird that they have here um, didn't cross at this at this time. Um, so it was probably a day where there were north winds and it felt that no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. And it ended up coming back down and just going through the Sioux. Um, and a lot of times you'll see that with the golden eagles, that they if the winds aren't right, they they don't make the, the, sorry, they don't make the move across. What they'll do is they'll just go around the bay and get in that way, um, add a few miles to the trip. I, I, I think it's, it's a real interesting um, snapshot of what a few birds do where we can extrap extrapolate that probably most of the other species still kind of follow the same, the same route. Um, other hawks, falcons, and eagles that come through the lower peninsula maintain an easterly trajectory and, and don't go to Whitefish Point. They'll just continue east and north. Um, while the birds that come up through Wisconsin will travel through the UP. Um, they'll follow the they'll might fly as far north as the lake shore and then just follow the shore. Especially your, your exhibitors and your falcons really like to follow the lake shore. Um, and and cross at the point. So, a little bit about migration behavior. So, recall when I do hawk counting, or we call it the hawk watch, or I'm the hawk counter. Um, but when we, it's, it's kind of like the traditional um, name for it. We're, we're counting all birds that are that are known as a group of birds called raptors. So when you're looking at a raptor, how do you know it's a raptor? And you know, the, you think they, they all look alike. You know, crow 
things that we're looking at here. Um, so what do you look for? Um, all hawks are big, right? Yeah, wrong. Um, this here is a bird called an American kestrel. And uh, I love this picture because it, it really shows how small the, the kestrel actually is. Um, it's 10 and a half inches long. Uh, it's smaller than a morning dove. And the sharp shin hawk is, you know, a, a small male can be smaller than a blue jay. Typically in raptors, the females are larger than the males. Well, typ typically, yeah, there's individual variation, but generally speaking, all the females are larger than the males. Um, so they have a large range of sizes from, from your tiny American kestrel all the way up to your bald eagle, which has a six foot wingspan. Now, all raptors have strong, sharp talons. It's all stuff that's in their family. So they have talons that can kill their prey instantly. Bob Oxford can will know just if, if a red tail is grabbing a rabbit, a lot of times they'll get it right in the back of the neck and get to the brain stem. Um, they have powerful wings. Um, these wings are good for soaring or for rapid flight as depending on what type of family uh, the bird is, what family the bird is in. Um, falcons are known for speed, Budios are known for their soaring, and your eagles are just these large, powerful flyers and the strongest flyers, and you will see that in their flight behavior. Um, they have that sharp bill, which is also good for snapping that brain stem like turn a falcon, bite it, uh, or rabbit in his neck and just instant kill. Um, and they have relatively large eyes, which are forward facing. If you look at songbirds or um, game birds, you can almost tell that the, the, the more when you're looking at predators and prey, all Prey species have one thing in common, they have eyes on the side of their heads, um, which allows them greater range of view so they can see where the predators are coming from while all the predators want to see. They have sharp focus where they're, where they're attacking. Um, so you even owls, all front facing eyes, so they can really, because uh, they only have one thing to focus on, their prey. And so you birds of prey or your raptors, like I said, come in three families. Um, you have your budios, which are your, your soaring hawks, your red tail hawks, your rough legs, red shoulders, and broad wings. Um, your falcons, which have longer, more pointed wings, um, built for speed. And your exhibitors, which are um, like forest hawks. Uh, you, they're, they're built with shorter wings and longer tails. They're built for maneuver, maneuverability. Um, so they, they can, they prey on birds, smaller birds, and they go through the forest, a lot of sharp turns and stuff. There's some great footage on YouTube, too, of I think a sparrowhawk in England that, that, that was, was filmed. And it's, it's an amazing uh, video. If, if you go on YouTube and just be going sparrowhawk hunting. Um, you can watch it, it's really short, but uh, amazing. Um, and the exhibitors are, are the hawks you'll find at your bird feeders. If you feed the birds and you see a hawk in your backyard on a tree or, or some old birds stay out, it's, it's usually a uh, shark shin or a cooper's hawk, depending on how close to in the city you are. Uh, cooper's hawks are an exhibitor that's done well in adapting to urban environments and the population has risen um, due to their adaptability. Um, so they're, they're much common, especially down in the southern part of the state of Michigan. Um, up here at Whitefish Point, uh, which is in a heavily, mainly just all forested area in the Upper Peninsula until you get to the eastern part. It's the it's the domain of the sharp shin hawk and, and the goshawk too. Um, so you're, you're more likely to see a sharp 
<laughs> my Boston accent is coming. I'm from Massachusetts. You shop shin hawk. <laughs> Um, and your and your goshawk before a corporation. Um, okay, so how to approach identification of um, raptors? I'm going to take you through each raptor that we're likely to see here at Whitefish Point. Um, so, I guess, like I just showed you before, the best thing you can do to organize your brain. Of, about upon what you're looking at is to ask yourself this question is is it a budio is it an exhibitor or is it a falcon um it's these it's these three basic shapes that they all they all have that you should try to get you know stuck in your in your brain of what you're going to be looking for when you, when you see because Raptor identification is basically a study of form and function, which leads to your physical and behavioral characteristics that you're going to be looking at as as they fly. Like I said, the exhibitors with the short wings and the long tails, or Budios with the big tails and the, the big wings. Um, I just noticed that eagles weren't on that one previous slide, but they're even they're, they're like. Budios on steroids, bigger wings, bigger, bigger tails, um, very powerful flyers. Um, so get ahead of myself. Wing, tail, and head shape proportions are key when looking at any raptor in the sky. So you and you're looking at the behavior of how does it fly? Um, is it a steady beat? Is it a soar or is it erratic? Falcons fly with a steady beat. The strong flyers, a peregrine falcon flying, it's just, it's it's going and going. Um, while, like I said, Budios love to catch the thermals, while your other hawks will um, occasionally join Budios in the thermal. You'll, you'll see some sharpies taking advantage of them, or in eagles, and even a peregrine falcon will take advantage of a thermal. Um, these are general guidelines to, to go by, or is an, an erratic type of flight where um, your exhibitors, like a sharp shin hawk, will do a lot of flapping and then it'll glide. It'll flap, 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 and glide. Um, and th those are key exhibitor traits: um, is the quick wing beats, and then and then the rest while they glide. Um, while I'm talking about being at a, a hawk watch, watching hawks, you know there, there are times throughout the year. If you're if you're hanging out in the winter and you see a hawk, or in the summer while they're breeding, you have a chance to study more behavior and looking at how the bird hunts. Um, this, but they kind of hunt a lot of like their behavior. We a red-tailed hawk will soar until it sees it sees some prey and then stoop and dive and try to catch it. Whereas exhibitors are, are more sitting at your bird feeder, <laughs> waiting for for uh, birds to come to the feeder. And they're smart. If if you watch your exhibitors that are coming to your bird feeders, they they learn depending on where your feeder's at. They kind of learn if, if you got it, if you're on the deck of the back of the house. I, I had a sharp shin hawk that would use the house as cover, come along the side, and then make an abrupt turn. It's like a big surprise because the, the feeder was right on the deck. The birds didn't see it coming because it was like, surprise, I'm here, boom. And they, and they got him. So I figured, well, that's not safe. I ended up putting, moving the feeders to the center of the yard where at least the birds had a chance. So if, if you want to give your your chickadees and your tip mice a fighting chance. Try not to keep your feeders close to bushes, close to any cover, where not only hawks can can jump or jump out around, but also cats or anything that use that anything that uses cover as for ambush. Kind of a kind of tangent there with the cats, but um, 
under the bird's head and then habitat, figuring out where these birds live. Um, how the brood, like your red-tailed hawks, you'll see them out in, in fields and, and, and rough-legged hawks like open spaces. Um, Fox hippies are like a forest hawks. And you'll, you'll find them in the forest or tied to bird feeders. So we'll start with the, the Budios. Um, this is the basic shape. It wide tails, wide wings. Um, and the common ones we'll see here at Whitefish Point are the red tailed hawk, the red shouldered hawk, broad wing hawk, and the rough legged hawk. They have long, broad wings and a short, wide tail. They're built to soar. And you look at those kettles, they make the circles in the sky. Um, so the most common booty of all is, is the red-tailed hawk. Um, like I said it prefers open habitat, you know, farms and woodland borders. Um, and they're bigger hawk, so they like um, bigger foods like you know, rodents, squirrels, rabbits. Um, not that they, they will also take birds too, um, no doubt. The predators will basically eat anything that they can fit in their beaks. Um, but typically, it's small mammals that the red tailed hawk goes after. And that, that's one of the big reasons if you're driving down the highway in the winter, they're the most common hawk you'll see. The most time, the most useful time you'll see red tail hawks is, is in the winter on, on the highway. You shouldn't be watching them while you're driving. It's not 30 mile drive, it's not recommended. <laughs> so your adult red tail hawks, I mean, they're named red tail for a reason. It's, it's a pretty obvious, um, ID when you see a hawk with a, they're the only hawk with a red tail that stands out. Um, it gets more confusing if you're always looking for a red tail to call it a red tail because the immature birds, um, which is what we're seeing a lot of now, and most of the adults move through earlier in, in the season. And now it's the younger ones that are having more um, They haven't molted into their adult plumage yet. And they do not have red tails. Um, but there's a few other key marks to look for is the belly band, um, which all red tails have to some extent. Um, it's this striation of feathers right across their belly, whether they're young or old, um, you all have this spotted band. Also, they have these Carpal wrist, wrist patches and these dark leading edges. They're, they're, they're a, a key thing to look for when they're when they're soaring above you in flight. Um, not so much in the younger birds, though. So again, that's when you're looking more at behavior and. Um, how they're soaring and what their, their size is if you have other hawks to compare them to. Um, and they soar with this slight dihedral. Dihedral is, is basically is what we call, is, is the fancy word for V. They have a, they have a slight V when they fly. Um, the next Video of a red shoulder hawk. It um, it's not very common up here uh, at Whitefish Point. We've had I think a couple dozen um, compared to like a few hundred red tails that we've had this season. Um, they're very handsome, but in my opinion, they're, they're just beautiful hawk. Red Budio, it's just a really handsome chest and the, these checked patterns are striking. Um, they're a raptor of, of the wetlands. Uh, they like 
by swamps and lakes. Um, they can all climb near water and they prey on a lot of reptiles. You'll see, you'll see them flying with snakes or like frogs and, and small rodents. Yeah, like I said, they have a full black and white pattern and in the sky. You'll really see this, these black and white checkering all along. The, these are what you call primary feathers um, right here on, on the end. And you'll just see them st stand out. You'll also see what, what this arrow is pointing to, referring to is um, windows. When the sun's shining, like it's, not really coming through as, as bright as it could look in real life. But you'll, you'll see these white C-shaped windows on the edges of their wings. They also push their wings forward in flight so the head appears a little smaller. You'll see this at this angle where, where red tails are kind of more straight across. So you get the C-shaped windows and they kind of make a C-shape with their wings. And of course they have this um, buffy color to them and, it's, and a lot of stripes on, on the white, these white bands on the tail stand out in flight also. Um, they're called red shoulder hawks, but you don't really see these red, you, you, at the hawk deck, you're usually looking from underneath, so we don't actually get to see the actual red shoulders. Um, but if they're perched, um, you do. Then there's the broad winged hawk, which is, which I, I think is a, is a marvelous booty. Um, they're they're arriving now. Like the the kettles we, we're seeing right now are mostly made up of broad hawks, um, and they're the longest distant migrant of all of the buyos that we see here. Um, they winter all the way down through Mexico um, into Central America, so that's why they're one of the last ones arriving. And still waiting for that big broad wing day. Um, to happen, um, which should be happening within the next week, I would I would think. Um, another very strong pattern. They have these dark tips and these black edges, trailing edges to their wings. It really stands out. Um, they do look appear chunky and they appear stubby that they're smaller than both the red tail and the red shoulder. So that they're, they're kind of a real chunky bird and they appear to, sometimes they can almost appear to be accipiter like because um, their, their wings do appear shorter and making their tails appear longer. Um, they all feed on small rodents and reptiles and amphibians also. Um, and in some spots, like down in, in uh, Texas and Mexico, I mean, they have kettles numbering, you know, six digits. Um, in Panama and stuff, it's just amazing, amazing numbers of, of uh, buddhas that, that fly through there. Um, like I said, they have a clear underwing, um, black primary tips. And the trailing edge is black. It really stands out as they fly over, as does um, the bands on the band at the end of its tail. Um, the tail bands really stand out. Um, but they do they keep a level posture when they glide and soar. And really, when when you look at them with the so often there'll be like some red tails in there with them also. Their, their wing shape has a much more pointy look as, as compared to what the red tail has with the, with the, fast, with the, with the fatter wing. Um, there's a couple of different looks. To make matters more confusing, when you get immature birds mixed in with adult birds, 
uh, it's, it's part of my job to pick out is it an adult or an immature um, also. So it gives you a lot more ID challenges than just identifying the exact species um, is trying to age them. And in, a, and in some cases, even, even sex at birth between male and female. Which, which is the case with a rough like an off you mentioned. Do they have distinct enough plumage where you can tell male or female? Um, some raptors don't like the red tail you they can't. So rough-legged hawk has been has been a great uh, season for rough legs uh, this year. Um, a huge number of them uh, came south in the fall, um, and we're seeing that reflected in the numbers that are coming back. Um, not matching, unfortunately. Like you, you never get as many birds coming back as you do going down because what what comes. What flies through in the fall is all is a lot of first year bull birds, um, and odds are always against you know young birds surviving to to make it back uh, to breed. So the numbers are always less. So it's, it's a spring counts are um, important in giving us. Uh, insight into the survivability of, of how the population is doing because you know and how many birds are going back to breed um, but it's great to see large numbers coming back in the fall because you know that they were successful in their breeding attempts and the, in the case of rough like they they breed way up in northern canada um, and they'll hang around uh in michigan in, uh, in the winter they'll come here and they'll um, you can find them in the eastern UP, and I, I think there are spots all through Michigan where you can find them. Um, they have, um, for Budios, they have a, a distinctive uh, hovering hunting style. You can see a, a Budio, a large hawk in the sky hovering. Um, odds are it's a, it's a rough legged hawk. Kestrels do it too, but they're just this little tiny thing, and they're, they're really fast. Very, very different than a rough leg. Um, so they'll fly and then they'll come up, they'll pull up and they'll hover and they'll be looking to see if there's any voles or field mice down there before when they go down to, to try and catch them. Um, but not the only ones, so red tailed hawks will also hover. Um, so it's not a guarantee you see one hovering in the air and it's automatically a rough legged hawk. Also, another beautiful, beautiful hawk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Call them all. Um, they're the most commonly, um, most hawks that, that are that distinct morph variations. Um, while you do have light morph and dark morph birds in other hawks, like there are dark morph and light morph red tails, and there are dark morph and light morph broad wings. It's most commonly seen in rough-legged hawks. Um, and so the light morphs, so a, a real heavy contrast. They get these really dark bellies with a white breast, chest, and, and neck, and it stands out. Um, well, the dark morphs are completely, are completely dark on the, are completely dark birds, the dark, um, Wings. Um, which is very distinctive. The white morph birds are also e easy to tell because they have these um, these carpal patches. They're, they're, whereas in the red tail, I said they have these C-shaped patches. The rough rough legs have just a big circular patch on there. So between a circular dark patch on each wing and a dark belly. They stand out in, in the sky. Um, it makes it even easier, easier to pick out. Um, also, they appear to be have a, a lankier look than what red tails have. They have slightly longer wings and slightly longer tails. They fly with a slight dihedral. Um, 
And what I've learned, if, if you see a bootio and it reminds you of a harrier, it's going to be a rough legged hog. So, and that's the bootios. Um, the excipiters now, with three distinct excipiters, they get your sharp shin hawk, your cooper sock, and your northern gossock. Like I said, they have relatively short, browner rings and a long tail. The agile flyers, being able to be very maneuverable through um, lush woodlands. Um, and they do this type of flight, like a flat, flat, flat glide, flat, flat, flat glide, um, versus a steady wing beat or a steady glide. Um, small hawk, 10 to 14 inches. Um, they breathe, breathe in heavily forest areas like the UP and like Canada. Um, often found at bird feeders. And yeah, they're, they're, they're bird hawks. They're built to eat other birds. Um, they had a very, they're the smallest of the exhibitors, so you're looking for these small birds with very stocky wings, um, very quick wing beats, more so than any other hawk you'd be looking at, besides falcons. But you see, if you see a hawk with very quick wing beats, it's going to be a sharpie. Um, look for a square, a squared off tail. And um, the, one of the key things I look for is a small head. Their, their head almost sinks into their, into their wings. You see how this, this wing's bent. So it, it barely comes out from, point pops out from the wings, um, which is the kind of key feature. Um, the amateurs have streaking and the adults have this rufous coloring underneath. Um, this is still a sharp shin hawk, but this is to illustrate how difficult identifying hawks might actually be. Um, when they're flying into a headwind, their wings get thrown back a little bit. And now it appears like his head is sticking out from, from the wings. So he's still looking at the speed of the wing beats and the squared off tail and in general, the, the size of the bird. Whereas Cooper's hawk, which is bigger than the shark shin, um, still feeds on birds and that bird feeders. You'll see right here how straight that is and how the head is just sticking way out in front of the wings. It's like a flying cross, opposed to the sharp shin hawk, where it's, it's, it's not a cross, it's just like a flying capital T or something, you know. Also, as you can see the size of the head here, how large it is compared to the sharp shin hawk here, which just has this kind of really tiny head on a big body. Once again, in, in flight, the head's sticking out in front of the, the straight wings, as opposed to the head kind of disappearing in, into the wings. Just another illustration, that head size is, is key. As far as flight behavior, um, you can also see the sharks and hawk in flight has these very quick, snappy wing beats. Whereas the Cooper's hawk is a larger bird and it, its wing beats are noticeably slower. Um, and the, the best way, if, if if there are people, if I was in front of a crowd of pe people, I'd have volunteers stand up and, and make like a chicken thing with their with their with their arms. Like that is for a sharp shin because you get these sharp wings and then try to do the same speed with your arms all the way out just as fast it's going to just be a lot slower
looking up close, um, you can see how the dark crown of the coops, the coops and the sharpie, <laughs> bigger head, more almost just more substantial bird than than the rounded small head of the sharp shin. Um, there's no contrast between the the head and the nape, which is the neck. We have this dark contrast here in the coops. Um, And its its eyes are also a little more set back, not as forward facing as the Cooper Sock. Um, this is kind of an illustration of just so you can understand the size of these birds and how they can. This American robin, the male sharp chin hawk, is about the size of a robin. Female slightly bigger. Male coops is a little bigger, female coops is a little bigger, and then finally you're up to a pro. So the big female co cooper's hawk is a, roughly the same size as a crow. I, oops. The goshawk um, is an even larger bird. In, in flight, they have much more substantial wings, almost Budio like with a longer tail, and also just a substantial body to them, whereas the Coopers or Sharks are a little more elongated birds, they just appear skinnier. Um, Goshawks like mature forest and deep forest with a kind of they're not an urban bird at all. Um, you'll see them here. Um, we have grouse populations, lots of rough grouse up here they'll prey, to prey on, um, shark tailed grouse, uh, spruce grouse. Um, pheasants and quail are all birds of, that, that uh, eat, the more substantial birds, um, so that they're better, just make better meals for them. Um, and like I said, they, since they're so heavy bodied, um, they, they can almost appear like a, a red tail or, or, or more kind of broad wing hawk. Um, an immature broad wing can appear to be a lot like an Im immature goss. Um, it's that tail that kind of is the giveaway to broad wing hawks have, have that shorter, stubbier tail. But in a lot of ways, they're very similar. And on to the falcons, your, your, your kestrel, your merlin, and your peregrine, and your jeer falcon. You can dream. Uh, the likelihood of seeing a jeer falcon in migration is, is very small, but from what I understand, there was a jeer falcon here on the upper peninsula for most of the winter uh, this, this past year. Falcons, they're, they have the long pointed wings, narrow tail, and they're Powerful flyers in, in flight. The, 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 the Merlins and peregrines will kind of just truck right along. They're very, and they head right out over the lake. Peregrine won't even hesitate. It'll just, I watched one just go north and straight, not even the shortest path. It was just going. Um, Ketchup was a little different. Ketchup was a little more fluttery than, than the Merlins or, or peregrines. And speaking of the kestrels, um, kestrels are, you'll most likely see a kestrel on a phone wire. Uh, they, they love to perch on the side. You'll be driving down the road and you'll see a telephone wire and you'll see a bird sitting up there. Um, and basically, they, they uh, sitting on that wire, they look like a morning dove with a big head. That's the best way to describe them. You know. Or if you see a bird that you think is a kestrel and has a tiny head, then it's a morning dove. But they like open areas, grassy fields. Um, they they will prey on birds, but they largely they'll feed on insects in when they're roaming, um, dragonflies, um, and small rodents. Um, and this, this is one of the falcons you can actually tell. Falcons 
you can tell the difference between the, the sexes because the males have the slate blue uh, wings, whereas the female is this uh, rufous colored all across. Um, it's, like I said, in flight, it's very buoyant, uh, not as direct as a merlin or a peregrine. Um, if you see a small bird hunting over a field, uh, hovering over a field, it's, it's, it's a kestrel. If it's hovering over the water, it's a kingfisher. If it's a big giant bird, it's, it's a rough-legged hawk or, or a red tail. It's paler from underneath than, than the merlins, which are more streaked in, in the, in the uh, peregrines. Um, and if you get to see it land, it'll actually, it'll, it'll bob after it lands. Um, I guess it's, it tries to balance. Um, now your merlin, about the same size as Kesha, a little bigger. Um, and it, it, it definitely likes to feed on birds more than kestrels do. Um, a lot of them will hunt along the shore looking for shorebirds. Um, I know back, back east in Massachusetts, that's where you're mo most likely to find them is if you feed on the shorebirds there. Um, they're very streaked. So you can see a heavily streaked dark bird, falcon flying through there, it's most likely a moon. Um, the males have Nice slate gray back all across. And again, just a heavily patterned falcon. As the female, it's brown. Um, I said these bold patterns on the wings, but it's got that typical falcon shape. Very pointed, not fat like the wheels or, or the occipiters. Uh, I said, direct flyers, they fly in straight lines. Um, it's, thicker at the, I mean, it's thicker at the base than at the tip. Um, if the peregrines have a mustache going across, um, not on your, on your, not as prominent on, on your Merlins. Um, and so it, as you get to see the birds more, it's, it's I guess it's chestier than, than an American castle. American castle because it's like a very thin falcon, whereas the Merlin just seems to be like, it, like it's been doing push ups all its life. Now, of course, your, your peregrine, um, mostly famous for being the fastest animal on the earth, um, reaching speeds of over 200 miles an hour in full stoop. Um, stupid and it's just when it's diving out of the sky. Um, you can find it in a variety of habitats now. Like a lot of a lot of cities have their own falcons now across across the country. Um, they they adapted to building nests on buildings in on bank towers, on mill towers, on bridges. Uh, I know there was a pair nesting on, on the Mackinac Bridge. I believe they had to be relocated because of work they do, they're doing on the bridge, but they do like to nest on bridges. Um, as, as, as well as cliff sides, um, which is where they will match uh, nest naturally. Um, there's cliffs just on the other side of Lake Superior in, in uh, Canada, I mean, uh, guaranteed it. Few of the of the peregrines that are crossing here are probably headed to those cliffs. Um, I won't really get into subspecies because it, it's another part of um, it's kind of an advanced hawk ID, but just know that they're out there. So when you when you look, everything I, I'm telling them, I'm telling you a lot of stuff. Um, A lot of the birds you're looking at are going to be have a, a wide variance in how they look. But there could be species, nor, northern species of red-tailed hawks, northern species, a tundra species of falcons. Um, all have slightly different looks to them. 
they got like the peregrines have this distinct hooded pattern. They got like, dark head, and they got this this mustache that just goes down their, their cheek. Um, but they're very long winged. They got a heavy body, um, and they have a dark tail. It's, it's, it's kind of squared off tail that, that extends out uh, behind them and a, just a very powerful wing beat um, that's almost un, unmistakable after, you, after you've seen them a few times. And, and next is, is uh, that's my, my personal favorite. It's, it's the gray ghost is what they call this bird, the Northern Harrier. Um, this is a male harrier, um, which has this, just this very light gray plumage, and it's all on the back too. And very light underneath, um, dark wing tips, and it's just a very beautiful bird. Um, they were formerly called the marsh hawk because um, they it's one of their preferred habitats is is hunting over marshes. Um, Again, looking for rodents and birds um, within the marshes. They'll also hunt over fields. Um, next, uh, they have just a very graceful flight, and they, they fly with it with, a, with a, one of the more distinct dihedral V patterns. Um, and when you have, in combination with these long wings and the V pattern, and they got a long tail also in just a, another long body so everything about them is just long so when, when you when you see this skinny bird with a long tail and, and a V pattern flying over um, it it should be telling you it I'm, I'm that's a harrier coming towards me um, one of the most diagnostic field marks is this white rump um, which all harriers, immature males and females, all show this white rump in flight. Um, so it is something you can wait for if you're watching a bird for a while and you're just waiting for it to, to turn into the light so you can get a look at that rump. That, that's, that's a dead giveaway. Otherwise, it's just looking for that, for that dihedral flight and a long tail. Um, they do have facial disc, um, which you might be able to see a little in this, this picture also, almost owl-like, they're kind of like almost in between an owl and a hawk in a, in a lot of ways. Um, they'll fly, or they'll hunt up in, into, into dusk in, in some habitats, you'll actually see them um, and short-haired owls hunting at the same time of day because this is, they're, they're looking for the Last meal of the day, first meal of the day. And the osprey, which we've seen a few of this year so far. Um, the cool thing about the osprey is is that it's it breeds throughout the the world. You know, it's uh, it's a polar so they're they're everywhere, um, and they're almost. It's exclusively piscivorous uh, fish eaters, uh, and naturally another hawk that that hovers. This is one I wasn't thinking of earlier, but when I said if you see a hawk hovering, a bird hovering over water, not only could it be a kingfisher, it could be an osprey. Um, very long wings, and because they have a white head, um, at a distance, you may at first think, oh, bald eagle. Or even a young bald eagle, uh, an immature bird, the first year, may or, or will have a lot of white on its belly and, and this uh, white underneath the wing. Um, so, so some some times just keep keep looking at it before you you make a decision on if it's an eagle or an osprey. Um, osprey are just much longer longer winged. Um, and in flight, their wing makes it uh, like a, a distinct M type of, of shape. Like these wings are, did I slide like that? No, I didn't. Um, 
a very like, so it looks like a flying M as it's coming towards you. Um, and it's, it's a black and white bird. It's a very, uh, as it gets close to you, you can really just see the black and white pattern that, that they have going. And then, yes, turkey vultures are counted at the, the hawk count, even though they're not hawks. Um, they're still a, a migrating bird that, um, since they're, they are very present at all the hawk counts, they, they, I guess they've just been universally accepted that they get counted also. Um, and they're, they're a bird um, that has a the most distinct uh, dihedral pattern of, of all, and they're very large too, it's much larger than, than the Harrier. Um, and they also do this teetering in flight that you can look for. So if you see if you see a bird that not flapping at all and just keeps doing this rocking motion in, in flight, it's just catching air uh, thermals in, um, and use them for all again. I, I, I think they're joy to watch it and of all the birds, uh, raptors that you see at the hog watch, I think they have the greatest command of thermals um, than any other raptor out there because they're, they're the masters of the thermal in, in my book. Um, a very striking pattern, a very dark bird, uh, with the, this, this silver gray uh, pattern that just stands right out. Um, in flight far away, they they appear to have practically no head at all, or just this tiny, tiny head that um, if it was a ball being or even a goal, and you would see something coming out. Hey, Rich, I don't know how many you have left to go, but we're at an hour. So if you want to. Really? Yeah, yeah, if you want to try and get through these just to be a little mindful of time. Yeah. but. So if people need to leave, we understand, but we yeah. won't let Rich finish up with these. Oh, really? Oh, geez. It, it felt like 20 minutes to me, I swear. I'm glad I didn't do the whole 500. <laughs> um, black vultures are very rare. Um, odds are you're never going to see them at a hawk, so we'll just get rid of that one. Here's one everybody knows. <laughs> uh, bald eagles, the adults are unmistakable in flight, of course. Um, white head, white tail. Um, stands right out. It's it's the it takes them five years to mature. So um, there's, there's all kinds of various patterns you'll see. But one thing in common is they got the long wings and the large head um, to look for, which makes them uh, stand out from a golden eagle, which has the very small head compared to a bald eagle. Um, and uh, yeah, it's the golden and bald. The, the golden also has a bit of a dihedral to look for, whereas the bald eagle flies with its wings straight out. And that's, that's one of the key things to look for when you try to tell your eagles apart. And now we're, we can go on to questions because the rest of the stuff is just about conservation and stuff. Perfect, thanks Rich. See, this is what happens when you truly love what you're doing. Time goes by a lot faster than you realize. Um, so we, I know we're, we're at time, but we will take a few questions. So if you have those, you can send those to us in the Q&A box on Zoom or through the comments section on Facebook. Um, we do have one question that was submitted um, when you were talking about morphs, they're asking about what the morph refers to. Is it changes in the bird's color and feathers or is it a permanent color difference? So, so we talk about morphs and birds. Um, what we're, we're talking about is it's a permanent um, colors. It's, it's not that they change their colors or they morph into a different color after being a certain color. Is it that their their bird that's going to be that that color type for its entire life? Perfect. Did anyone else have any other questions? If you want to submit those to us real quick. Um, in the meantime, I will say um, that Rich, we really appreciate you being here with us today. And we really appreciate everyone else being here with us today. Um, so I hope you were all able to learn 
some new great Rabdry ID tips. There's um, a lot of information that you, right. it's, 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 when I'm given this, I'm like, geez, this is a lot. Nobody's going to remember any of this. <laughs> yeah, the great part is you can watch it again. And yeah. so you yeah. can you can watch this again as many times as you want. Rich is at the Hawk Deck through the end of the month. So if you are going to make a trip up to WPDO, he is there. Of course, his primary objective is counting the birds, but you know, yeah. I'm sure he would love to to point some things out to you guys as well. Yeah. But um, and I that's the best wanted, way to learn. Yeah, exactly. I also wanted to just small push um, for the Hawk program and the other efforts at Michigan or at WPDO. If you're interested in supporting them, um, please consider donating to our annual Birdathon fundraiser. You can find more information about that at um, WPDO.org, as well as lots of other information about how you can support the organization um, and the work that's being done. So it doesn't look like we have any other questions, but people seem to be thanking you, Rich, in the Q&A box. So yeah. I will one more time also thank you and thank you to everyone else who joined us this evening. Um, we are really happy to have you, really happy to have Rich. Um, next Thursday at 7, we'll be joined by our, our WPBO Waterbird counter, Matthew Winkler, to learn about Waterbird ID. So lots more for us to learn. And um, we're really looking forward to it. So thank you again to everyone and enjoy the rest of your yeah, evening. Great. I'm sorry for going long. <laughs>